Genesis 39, uh, page four, uh, 34 in your pew Bibles, starting at verse 1. Now, Joseph had been taken to Egypt. An Egyptian named Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guards, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had brought him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, serving in the household of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made everything he did successful, Joseph found favor with his master and became his personal attendant. Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed all that he owned under his authority. From the time that he'd put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph. The Lord's blessing was on all that he owned in his house and in his fields, and he left all that he owned under Joseph's authority. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. After some time, his master's wife looked longingly at Joseph and said, Sleep with me. But he refused. Look, he said to his master's wife, With me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in his house, and he has put all that he owns under my authority. No one in his house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. So how can I do this immense evil, and how can I sin against God? Although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her. Now one day he went into the house to do his work, and none of the household servants were there. She grabbed him by his garment and said, Sleep with me. But leaving his garment in her hand, he escaped and ran outside. When she saw that he had left his garment with her and had run outside, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, my husband brought a Hebrew man to make fools of us. He came to me so he could sleep with me, and I screamed as loud as I could. When he heard me screaming for help, he left his garment beside me and ran outside. She put Joseph's garment beside her until her master came home, or his master came home. Then she told him the same story. The Hebrew slave you brought to us came to make a fool of me. But when I screamed for help, he left his garment beside me and ran outside. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, These are the things your slave did to me. He was furious and had him thrown into prison where the king's prisoners were confined. So Joseph was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. He granted him favor with the prison warden. The warden put all the prisoners who were in the prison under Joseph's authority, and he was responsible for everything that was done there. The warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And the Lord made everything he did successful. Uh, The story of Joseph is a pretty familiar tale, isn't it? Uh, It's one that I heard growing up as a kid uh, and one that I'd read in kids' books. It's the roller coaster of fortune. The highs and lows of Jacob's favorite son, sold into slavery in the house of Potiphar, where he's elevated because of his good work, held in high regard by his master and blessed in all that he does. He's the golden goose. Whatever he touches turns to gold. The situation changes, though, uh, dramatically after fleeing from temptation, accused of something he didn't do and unjustly thrown into prison. But not keeping a good pup down, he rises again to a place of authority in prison where he again is held in high regard by his master, eventually becomes second in Egypt only to Pharaoh. It's a story we have heard growing up and a story we're probably familiar with. But what's the point of Genesis 39? 
Uh, Is the point of Genesis 39 to highlight Joseph's rise to success? Work hard, trust in God, and there will be growth and prosperity? Or is it Joseph's morality? Uh, How to when it comes to facing sin and temptation? Uh, It's easy to read Scripture through old lenses and to latch on to what we know and are comfortable with. I want to suggest that those themes are important, and we'll come back to them, but they're secondary to a much larger theme that has been weaving its way through our series in Genesis, and all throughout Genesis as a whole. So before we get stuck into the passage, let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you that it reveals you to us. I thank you that we can see your nature and see uh, how you act towards your people. I pray that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts open to your message. Uh, All these things in Christ's name. Amen. So, where are we in our series in Genesis? Uh, If you haven't been with us, uh, let me recap with you, uh, recap for you. If you have been with us, uh, let me recap for you anyway, because uh, the last few weeks have been a little bit chop and change. Uh, chapter 36, we saw the line of Esau, uh, the family of Esau, and how he represents living for the now, living for a bowl of soup, living for what, whatever woman he could find instead of how God's people should be living, living now in light of eternity. Chapter 37 was the beginning of the family history of Jacob. Now that bit's important. It's not the history of Joseph, but the family history of Jacob, uh, with a particular focus on Joseph, which ended with Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers. Now we saw that Joseph's brothers had more interest in their own desires and dreams than they did for God's. In 38, we got an in-depth view of the character of Judah, the one who, surprisingly, would be, who would carry the line of kings by God's grace. Now, Bernard helpfully reminded us of the time frame covered in 38, uh, so it's about 20 to 25 years, And we saw that sin is serious, sin is judged, and sin is exposed. So that's where we have been. Uh, So point one on the outline, where we are now, chapter 39. And it brings us back to the end of chapter 37. Uh, We've gone back 20 to 25 years, back to Egypt. And we see that with the connection made in verse 1. Uh, so for 37, chapter 37 ends, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph into e- in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guards. 39 begins, Now Joseph had been taken to Egypt. Uh, we're no longer in Kansas anymore. We're no longer in Canaan, the promised land. Nor are we following the family of Jacob. As readers, we are transported back to Egypt, back into the home of Potiphar, the captain of the guards. And the first thing that we're told from the author of Genesis is that the Lord was with Joseph. Even though we are out of the promised land, the Lord is with Joseph, watching over him, caring for him, directing him, Now, I don't know about you, but if I was Joseph and in his position, I would imagine it would have been very easy to cry out to God asking, where is God in all this mess? In the midst of family dysfunction, being regarded as property to be merely bought and sold, and being in a land so foreign as to not recognize culture, customs and language, Joseph had every good reason to look around and wonder where God was. 
I wonder if we have the same attitude when things come up. We wonder, where is God in this situation? For Joseph, uh, at this point, he has two options. Uh, to give in to the culture around him and to get by in any way that he saw fit, forgetting that God or forgetting that the Lord was with him, or to live in light of God's promises. Now, the Lord had appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob on numerous occasions and declared to them that the Lord, their covenant keeping God, would be with them and would not leave them. Now, this faithfulness to his people must have been in Joseph's mind as he served Potiphar. And we see in verse 3 that even Potiphar, a pagan Egyptian, could see that the Lord was with Joseph. Now, when we read Scripture, it's important to notice words or phrases that are repeated. I hope you caught it when the passage was read out. What was the phrase that came up the most and was repeated over and over again? The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with the Lord, the Lord. The Lord blesses Joseph and his time under Potiphar and while in prison. Now, the term blessed, it's not a material blessing or prosperity, but rather the Lord gives his approval to Joseph. Now, there is nothing in Joseph that earns the blessing. It is by grace that he receives it. We are to make less of Joseph being blessed and more of the one giving the blessing. The Lord is blessing Joseph's work as a way of showing himself to Potiphar. God's promise to bless the nations through Abraham, Abraham's descendants is starting to be fulfilled. The Lord is central to the blessings shown in 37 or 39. And compared to Joseph... For a character who doesn't speak throughout the whole chapter, the Lord is front and centre, the main focus of all that is happening. What was implied in chapter 37 is now made very clear in chapter 39. We see how much it shapes Joseph's life in the two examples given. Now, the first is his work under Potiphar. And, and then the jailer. Knowing that the Lord was with him, Joseph can work as though working for the Lord. Now, whether he is a slave or personal assistant or a prisoner or warden assistant, his identity is marked by who he works for. Now, it's the same reason Paul, when speaking to the church in Colossae, can say in chapter 3, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. The second example is shown in Joseph's interactions with Potiphar's wife. Joseph's reality and thinking is shaped by a knowledge of God. His natural response is infused with a knowledge that the Lord is with him. Now, to act in the way that Potiphar's wife demanded was an immense evil in and of itself, but more so against her husband, and it was a sin against God. Knowing that the Lord was with him enables Joseph to act in a righteous way, even if it means an unjust outcome. Does Joseph deserve prison? No. No. But even in the situation, the Lord is with him and extends kindness, or the word is hesed, covenantal faithfulness to Joseph, and again gives his approval. So at point two on the outline, throughout Genesis 39, Joseph is the means through which we see the Lord actively working, ever present and involved. Now, last week we saw, through Judah's sons, the Lord's active involvement. 
Ur was wicked in the Lord's sight, and so the Lord put him to death. The same is repeated for Onan. The Lord is present and active among his people, saving and caring, judging and correcting. God, the creator and sustainer of the world, revealed himself personally to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He made a lasting covenant with them, a binding promise and contract that said he would be their God and they would be his people. He didn't stay distant, but he's intimately involved. And that's why it's so important to note the use of language with the text. Who was with Joseph? God? No, it's not God was with Joseph. It's Yahweh, the Lord, was with Joseph. Lord in all capitals. And the only time that the word God is used is when Joseph uses it when refusing Potiphar's wife. Joseph knows God and seeks to live a life honouring to God, even if that means unjust consequences. Uh, It's we as readers who understand that it's not just God, creator and sustainer, but Yahweh, the Lord, that is with him. In Genesis 37, 38, 39, and all of Genesis, uh, it was written not just as a historical account For the Israelites, the author of Genesis, uh, who most agree was Moses, was writing to show the Israelites coming out of Egypt, how they got to the point where they are, who they are as a people and who their God is. Uh, They are the first readers of Genesis and they are the ones to whom these stories are being told knowing that the Lord was with Joseph throughout his time in Egypt, guiding and directing the course of his life, should have been of great comfort to the Israelites. It wasn't, Moses is showing that it wasn't chance that Joseph, uh, that brought Joseph to Egypt, nor was it chance that Jacob was saved by Joseph during the time of the famine. It was the Lord who brought the Israelites down to Egypt and it was he who brought them out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. The Israelites are in the wilderness and they have seen the great deliverance of the Lord's people from slavery with great power and mighty acts. They had been redeemed from the hand of Pharaoh And now they face the same test of faith as Joseph. In uncertainty, where would they turn? Wandering through the desert, who would they look to for their strength? On the cusp of the promised land, Moses would remind them of God's promises to them. We heard it read to us from Deuteronomy 31. The Lord, Yahweh, is the one who will go before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. It's not just God, the creator, who will go with them, but Yahweh, the covenant-keeping, steadfast God. When we read through the Old Testament, we see too often God's people wandering away because they have forgotten that the Lord was with them. They seek comfort and security in foreign nations. They fall prey to the pleasures of the cultures around them. And when faced with disaster or famine or even prosperity, they turn to idols of stone and wood. Gods that can't hear, speak or see. The knowledge of the Lord present among his people should have been the starting place for how the Israelites viewed relationships, work and business, money, worship, and proclamation of the Lord's promises to the nations. 
Now, the story of Joseph should have been a reminder to the people of Israel that in famine or feast, the Lord was ever present, that he would not leave them or abandon them. And this should be the same lesson that we receive with joy. But we have even more to be thankful for than the Israelites who were wandering in the desert or even the Jews living in Jerusalem in the shadow of the temple. Uh, So point three on your outline. One of the cries of God's people in the Old Testament was that God would send a redeemer, a rescuer to save them as in the days of the exile. But instead of another prophet, the Lord himself would step into history as a human, becoming the God-man. I hope the astonishing truth wasn't lost on you when you heard uh, from God's word, God himself speaking to us in Matthew 1. At the point when we were so deep in our sin and there was nothing that we could ever do to make it right, God steps in. No amount of washing could make us clean. No amount of sacrifices could make us righteous. No amount of good works could pay the debt before God. Uh, Now, don't judge me too harshly, but we have already started listening to Christmas carols. I know it's only only, partway through November. We've still got a long time to go. Uh, But I love carols. Uh, Less jingle bells and more the traditional ones. Uh, They capture uh, the truth of God's word in wonderful poetic language. Uh, O Holy Night uh, shows the anticipation uh, beautifully of a world longing for God to be with us. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. The thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Uh, It wonderfully captures our longings and answers our questions of where is God? God has come to dwell among us in bodily human form, and so yonder breaks a new and glorious morning. In Jesus, our Emmanuel, God is with us. Just as with Joseph in famine or feast, Christ the Lord is with us. It's something the Israelites too often forgot, and it's something I suspect we forget too. I hope you had a chance to read the article that Bernard put up on the church's website uh, earlier this week. Uh, I was having a read of it, uh, and it's about how we often overlook uh, the temptation of godliness, or often overlooked temptation of godliness. In his article, Trevon Wax describes how the busyness of the world crowds out God until he is sidelined and plays a minor role in our lives. Uh, He says, In our secularizing society, it isn't the presence of sin that defines our culture, but the absence of God. We've constructed a human-centered world where God is peripheral, flitting here or there at the edges of life, waiting to be summoned as a source of therapeutic benefit or comfort in distress, but otherwise safely settled in a distant realm from our day to day. Now, touching pretty close to the bone, he goes on to ask, how often do I, as a Christian, live as if God were absent? How often does the all-powerful I crowd out the great I am? How often does the all-powerful I crowd out the great I am at the center of my thoughts and aspirations? How much of our worship, our gatherings, our goings, our service and ministry is done without any real thought to the presence and power of God? Now, I don't know about you, but that uh, hit pretty close to home. 
or we have not been left wondering whether God is with us. The same promise that the Lord spoke to Moses in Deuteronomy are the same that Jesus gives his disciples and he gives to you and me. Having defeated death on the cross at the end of the book of Matthew, Jesus proclaims that all power and authority has been given to him. And he sends, and in this power, he sends out his disciples to proclaim his name to all the nations, making more wholehearted student followers of Jesus. And he leaves us with the promise that he would surely be with us till the very end of the age. Why would we forget about our covenant-keeping God who never forgets about us? When discouragement and suffering or even success comes upon us, do we seek comfort or praise in worldly sources or do we seek the Lord who is always with us? So when you're in the playground and feel like you've got no friends, remember that the Lord is with you. When you tank your school test or your uni exams and feel like a failure, remember that the Lord is with you. When the promise of that dream job has been that you've been working towards evaporates, remember that the Lord has not left you nor forsaken you. As newlyweds or those celebrating 40th, 50th anniversaries and you're struggling with sexual fulfillment, rest in the Lord knowing that he is with you in those struggles. When you come to the end of a productive working career and start wondering what the next phase will look like, the Lord will be with you through those transitions. When we have been gifted with additional income, Does it go towards our own desires and wants? Or can we gift it back to God for the growth of his kingdom, knowing that the Lord is with us and will supply all of our needs? In feast or famine, the Lord, Yahweh, was with Joseph, guiding and directing his life. Joseph, in response, worked as though working for the Lord and seeking to live a godly life framed with God at the centre, even at great cost, knowing that the Lord was with him. For the Israelites, hearing this part of Joseph's story on the edge of the promised land, it should have brought great comfort and driven them to a dependence on the Lord in all that they did. And yet we have their example as a warning of what happens when we sideline the Lord to a comfortable place in our lives. Now, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, ultimately fulfills our craving to have the Lord dwell with us and promises to never leave us. I rest in the promise that the Lord is the one who will go before you. He will not leave you or abandon you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not forget that the Lord is always with you. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you that you never leave us and that you will never abandon us. Uh, Lord, we confess that there are so often times when we go about our day and we forget about you. Forget that you... Uh, have promised to be with us. Father, we often rest in our own strength and we take the course of our own life that we want. Father, I pray that uh, knowing that you are with us will comfort us uh, and comfort those who feel as though, God, that you are distant. Uh, we know that you are not distant. So comfort us in that time. Our Heavenly Father, we pray though that you would challenge us and challenge us during those times that we distance you to the sidelines. 
when we push you out of the center. Help us to remember that you are always with us in all that we do. Amen.